All right. Here we are. Episode 30. Yes, sir. How you doing, man? I'm good. Ending November. About to start last month of the year. Yep. So the year has gone by quickly. It, it has. 30, 30 shows have gone by quickly. Yep. Uh, great responses from our last show. Yeah. yeah. Lots of good feedback. Um, we will definitely be doing more guests in, in 2024 mm -hmm. and excited about getting them all booked. But we've reached out to a couple of really great guests already who have said yes. So we just got to get them scheduled. And uh, I was looking at the show notes that you pulled together for today. And what a week it's been. Yeah. Out there in the world. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, usually over a holiday. Thanksgiving is kind of quiet coming back. But it wasn't quiet this week. Lots yeah. going on. So we had the passing of uh, Rosalind Carter. Yeah. Oh. Uh, First Lady. And with the passing of Charlie Munger. I know. Yeah. And then we had the passing of Henry Kissinger. And I think what's incredible about all three is late 90s and then 100. Yeah. So no early passings there, but all three icons, um, two of those in the government and one, you know, uh, potentially – the, one of the greatest investors of all time that yeah. we don't actually refer to as the greatest investor of all time, right? Yeah, I mean, I think all three really had a huge impact on the last century. Especially America. And, yeah, yeah. And it's just, um, I mean, it's sad, and it's also kind of a change in the guard. Like, they're, that whole class of really important people in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, where they were really kind of deciding a lot for America, they're no longer with us anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've been certainly reflecting a lot lately on, I think, our generation, Generation X, mm -hmm. um, the fact that we are in that window where our giants are passing away. And uh, it's it's the it's the weirdest thing to sort of realize that People aren't just passing away, but like your generation of giants. Yeah. You know, the ones yeah, the that people you grew up looking, looking up to. Looking up to. Yeah. yeah right. Um, are, are passing away. And I think this is the part of the, the midlife crisis that doesn't get talked about a whole yeah. lot. You know, people talk about, oh, you know, he's on a motorcycle or he's getting a right. convertible right. or, you know, um, you know, any, any one of those silly things that, that kind of is, is, uh, meant to say that, you wish you were young again. And maybe that's part of it, but I think it's much more the the inevitable uh, sense of mortality that sort of just descends upon you because your giants begin to pass away. Yeah, it's it's definitely makes me realize my own mortality. It always also, I think, makes me realize that the our generation X has to begin to step up. And, yeah. And the role models that we all learned from, I don't think that template works in today's world. And one of the things I like about this podcast is it forces me to think through all of this news coming at me faster than I'm really am comfortable absorbing, but I have to figure it out. Yep. But the landscape is shifting, the geopolitical landscape is shifting. Technology world shifting, the healthcare environment's shifting, and there's not a good template just to pull out. We have to sort of invent it uh, for ourselves, which is yeah. kind of daunting. It's maybe it, it's exciting, but also there's a lot of daunting aspects of it. Agree. All right. So with that, let's jump in. All right, starting with a story about the Bureau of uh, Economic Analysis that uh, did a update to the GDP growth number for Q3 and found that it wasn't in the high fours. It was actually in the low fives. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They revised uh, GDP up. Yeah. Which is great news. I mean, th this entire story is great news. GDP was up and then the monthly inflation um, thing, not CPI, but PCE, which is the personal consumption expenditure, it's related to inflation, was 
down slightly. And so all all good news. It the story is written as um positive the Fed is likely done, maybe we're in a soft landing, Goldilocks kind of um news article. And I'm hopeful. All the data seems really positive. There's something like in the back of my head that just makes me a little nervous to like call it over and say we're we're in the clear. So yeah. I, I'm still a little bit cautious, but but the news is all is all good. Yeah, I, I mean, um, the news so, that came out of the BEA uh, really showed the strength of corporate America, um, Wall Street. <laughs> Stock market back. Uh, we're going to run through some numbers here yeah. shortly about some of the the big healthcare companies, um, but but clearly, you know, our our economy is doing great, but it's because of certain shifts that it's made, and there's still some dislocation that needs to bear out. I think, in particular, we have not yet seen what is going to go down around corp uh, around corporate real estate. Um, I'm. St- I'm seeing people in the corporate real estate space look really stressed when I see them in person. Yeah, just around around town. Around right? town. Yeah. yeah. Right. When, when I when I talk to people in corporate real estate, they look really stressed. Mm-hmm. They don't look like they're having a good time. They don't look like the economy is doing well for them. And I'm now actually starting to hear them talk about the debt burden, mm-hmm. um, how a lot of their terms are up for renewal. And they're going to be rewritten, and the debt servicing numbers are really challenging, and the capital markets are still closed. I think that's one thing that if you're in the private markets, you view the economy a little bit differently because you're still looking at how the capital markets are moving. And as we've been talking about for 29-plus episodes now, uh, the private market capital is not flowing yet. Um, so it's nice that the stock market is starting to turn and rip, but it has not come down to the to the private markets. And so there still might be some more bankruptcies, some more dislocation uh, to come, and and we'll see what those impacts are. Yeah, and we were talking about this earlier in several episodes ago. The the indexes, S and P five hundred, for instance, it really is seven names that are carrying the entire growth of the index for the whole year. So if you pull out those seven names, which are largely, I think they're all tech, the big tech companies. Except for Berkshire. Yeah. It looks like the index is great. But then when you go below it, below that, <laughs> I mean, there's, there's 493 other companies. Right. They are all combined. They're down for the year. So I, I think the stock market is never the exact same as the Main Street economy because it's it's wealthier people that have assets in the stock market. And I don't know if the the regular folks' paychecks are keeping up with inflation, even though inflation is coming down. Um, it's cumulative. So it doesn't it hasn't gone negative. So you're still getting slight price increases. And I don't know that payrolls are keeping up with that but it but it's on the net it's good and the fed seems to be doing a good job pulling it back fairly slowly there hasn't been anything that's really broken yet i think real estate is a huge risk factor um and we're we're benefiting from the technology which is great and i'm glad we have it as a country but it's not evenly distributed. No, so. no. I mean, if the rates don't come down, uh, there are going to be parts of the economy that are going to be broken for a, for a sustainable amount of time. So it, this is all good news to me insofar as it actually leads to rates coming down in the first half of 2025, I mean, 2024. Th- then, then I would see it as good news. I mean, otherwise – it's it's fine, but as you said, that concentration in the in the stock market that's yeah. a real thing. Yeah, um, and you know we're about to move into a consolidation story right now, right? Uh, you know yeah. the the big healthcare news of the week is the announcement that Cigna and Humana are working on a on a merger. Um, 
what was it two weeks ago that that the news about Cigna spinning off uh, HealthSpring? Yeah, uh, yeah, their MA, their it, MA business, and we're we're gonna do a, a deep dive on MA um, yeah. here very shortly with Emily Evans from Hedgeye because there's a lot of stuff happening in the MA space, mm-hmm. and it really deserves its own yeah. entire episode to really dig into yeah, what's huge going on. Changes in how CMS is running the MA program. Yeah, big yeah. time, big time. But but this you know this kind of makes sense and. Uh, Makes sense of the HealthSpring spinoff, right? Yeah, right. Um, because anytime this kind of merger is going to happen, the two parties and they're and they're as big as these two are. One is in the eight billion range, one's in the six billion range from a market cap yeah. perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, you got to start spinning stuff off, right? You yeah. know, if you if you want to get the deal done, you got to start spinning right. stuff off. Right. And obviously, HealthSpring would have been the, you know, the key asset to, right. to spin off. Although there's likely going to be other assets that. Um, the two parties will have to consider spinning off, probably especially in the in the drug space. Yeah, I mean, you you had an inkling of this when they spun it off. I don't know if we did it on the air because it wasn't confirmed things, but yeah, but you you knew this was maybe on the agenda. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. Like Cigna is really strong on the commercial book ASO with businesses that are self insured, and Humana is almost a pure play Medicare Advantage. Yeah. Platform, so they're very complementary together. I'm sure the regulators will look at it because anything this size, they're going to look at. But it's hard for me to see how, with HealthSpring now spun off, th- there's not a lot of overlap. Overlap, yeah. I mean, there's not much that I can see that you would have a problem with, really. Um, and honestly, it o- is other other than the pure size, just the pure size, yeah. Right. But 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 then you have to say, okay, but there's other much bigger, bigger. <laughs> groups. And so I think it's actually healthy to have some some consolidation so that we have a group of large insurance, large payers that are multidisciplinary. They start they're all doing um, healthcare delivery too now. And I think it's a good combination. I'm excited about it. it I, uh, I I think what's really interesting about this is that Humana is almost certainly the best MA yes. business. Yes. Very well run. Period. Yeah, that's right. And you can make a case the Cigna is the strongest employer. I think they are. Based yeah. insurance company as well. So there's a real – and Cigna has the Evernorth business line. So they've yep. got their health services data yep. play they in have place. have a good-sized PBM. Yep. Yeah. Express scripts. Yep. And Humana's got the Centerwell – Mm-hmm. Asset yeah. in place, so this is actually a fairly high quality merger. I would say where yeah. I'm not sure that one plus one just equals two. You know, it it really could be a yeah. I think that's right. A, a very that's value I mean. very creating merger. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But just because of the quality of the assets, right? You know, it's not just the size, but Humana being like the de facto MA business right. out there, right? Right. Um, yeah. So I at least want to give a shout out to the to the advisory board. Um, you know, of, of all the data sources that we look at, they're one that we yeah. we we study, and I thought they did a great review in a very short time right. on right. the the Cigna and the Humana um, merger. So we'll we'll put this in the show notes. Don't need to say too much about it, other than they do a good job of framing up um, the overall health insurance business in America. You know, they basically say that there's six players uh, in the mm-hmm. space. And that um, so the six players that they point to United Healthcare, CVS, Aetna, Elevance, Cigna, Humana, and Centene. Right. Um, and so if you obviously if you merge Cigna and Humana, now you're at five. Um, UHC far and away the the leader. Um, CVS sort of right behind it from a revenue perspective at least. Um, and then Cigna Humana would would be the third. Right. Then they would come right. in. They would be the third, and again, they'd be a pretty high quality third. Yeah. Um. In in that game, so this and is, this is a pretty, big, It's a big play. Yeah. It's it's a huge deal, and I think a really interesting combination. And then when I look at these remaining five platforms, right? I mean, UHG is its own thing. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. It's yeah, huge yeah, yeah. and really well run in a lot of areas. The the winner. I mean. Look, yeah. so, so, until someone takes it from them, yeah. the winner. And Humana and Cigna combining gives them a chance to to compete. That's there. right. That's right. Uh, CVS Aetna is – they have their own strategy. They have a much bigger retail yep. 
presence, which has advantages, yep. has some negatives too. Elevance is really the blues. I mean, it, they're and not even right. I mean, not even all the blues. That's right. But but, but that's their path or that's their niche. And Centene is is really strong on the government side. If you take Humana and combine it, they're the they're the last pure play Medicare Medicaid. I know, but platform. I do feel like a lot of what I hear about Centene lately is just them getting dinged mm -hmm. left and yeah. right with all the changes that are happening, uh, right. you know, at, at the CMS level. So, um, and I'm not sure. Do, does Centene have a, a like a proper uh, Optum, you know? Health services business of scale and of note. not of scale. They may have. Yeah, I'm sure they have something, not, but not, not not even as big as like Evernorth, which is Cygnus. Right. It's not even that developed. Right. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, Elevance at least, as we covered yes, a couple right. episodes yes. ago, has Carillon, and that's developing right. pretty nicely. And you know, they need to add more of the the, the state blues to the platform mm -hmm. overall to get sort of the scale yeah, from a membership right. perspective. But the, you well, know, that, that's the, what I meant. That's pretty their rapidly path to sort of buy and partner with with, with, with blues. blues plans. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So, uh, yeah, look, check this advisory board story out uh, or their take. It's not really a story, um, but their their analysis of the, the deal. I think they do a really good job of, of framing it all up. And, of course, you know, the deal is going to have to get through the FTC. Right? right. So that's I mean, obviously, this is sending all sorts of bells off in Lena Khan's office. And, you know, uh, I, I think their default stance is going to be no, but they're going to have to, you know, the the, bur I mean, the burden of proof is going to be on yeah, them. They to, have to, to show it. how it is. Hurting competition, right? And I, I, it's hard for me to see where that case comes. Yeah, and and they ha they have to show that on the heels of the news that didn't really get covered this week, yeah. because of the Cigna and Humana merger news, which is UHG had their investor day this week. Yeah, so they had their investor day yesterday. So this was the biggest story we we're going to cover until today, because uh, Cigna and Humana came out today, right? I mean. It, I that think, timing, by the way, probably not an accident. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, think, I, think that, I think that's right. I, listen, United Health Group is very strong on, on they're firing all cylinders. They're they're just really good and impressive. I mean, they they really have sort of built out all the different pieces. Optum is, I mean, everyone knows United Health Group insurance side is strong. But Optum has been the growth engine that's just incredible, incredible scale. They have 90,000 docs on salary. So they already were the number You're one. Probably employer. the equivalent in tech workers. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean that that's the part to me is like the docs is super impressive. Um, but my God, they they are a tech company. Yeah. Optum is a tech and data company. Yeah. That's and and it's pretty well integrated together. I mean, it works. And what I was impressed, I didn't, I didn't bring the stats, but Optum has a lot of payer clients that are not UHG. They have oh, yeah. selling services and also learning from all the other payers. Totally. And so it's just a huge. Advantage. They own advisory board. Yeah, they <laughs> I mean, own advisory board. They own Change Healthcare. They own patients like me. They they own a whole bunch of assets. They own Abbey Health. They own a bunch of things. That's right. That's right. Um, and and it it is worth just pointing out their their revenue uh, yeah. hit. Uh, so Vic, I'll, you you found this, so I'll let you share. The, well, I mean they the they published it. I, I had to do the math. I think I did it four different times. Yeah, just to make sure I didn't you believe it. <laughs> they. Brought in four hundred billion in revenue last year. No, this is the outlook for next year. Yeah, four hundred billion for next year, and then the the profits, or so earnings, is thirty five and a half billion. So the numbers are just staggering. It, it's a huge and really well run operation, and they're yes. very transparent. And, and they they had their investor day on the internet. I I'm nothing special. I just want, went on and watched it. It's just open. And, and and I think you know if I'm chief legal for Signa and Humana, I just sort of point to this, this is like Exhibit One. I right. point to this and I point to Change Healthcare and I point to LHC and I just sort of say, I mean, yeah, we're we're it's we're, hard so, to... we're so small compared right. to the, right. to the leader. Like we're so small compared to the leader. 
Um, I think there's a case for me that actually having a strong number two and number three I would is agree. beneficial to market competition. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I would agree. Um, and, 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 and really, CVS is very, very uh, comparable in terms of revenue size, but the makeup of their business is not that comparable. Yeah. Whereas what Cigna and Humana would combine, put together, would actually be very analogous to what UHG has put together. Like the, the design of the platform, you know, not really having these retail drugstores, right. storefronts right. and stuff like that. Um, it's just a much more similar business model. Um, and so they, I, I think you're right. I think they do become third overall in the in the yeah. sort of payer landscape in the United States, but probably the close second competitor in terms of business model and approach to the market with yeah. two high quality in, insurance brands. Right. And I mean, I think CVS has done a really good job navigating from where they were five or 10 years ago no to where they question. are now. Oh, so but, excellent navigation. But I think the um, future trajectory even though the combination of Cigna Humana would be slightly smaller, I think they're positioned really well to to be a, a good alternative. Agree. Agree. So now that we've talked about the the, the payers, payer. yeah. we, we, we need to circle back to some provider stuff that we kind of got lost in because of all the AI stuff that popped up mm -hmm. and we just kind of stopped talking about healthcare for a minute. <laughs> right. um, but something really big was announced from CMS uh, in early November, which was they finalized the physician payment rule. And mm -hmm. um, why is it big? Well, it's big because there is a decrease uh, in the rates for physicians, um, a decrease of 3.4% from the the last year. Yeah. And it's not clear to me how they calculate that, but I think it's going to apply pressure to physicians, obviously. I mean, we're in a high inflation environment, and decreasing the physician payment schedule it seems a challenge. So. And and what's <laughs> – I, I mean, I, I think what's – of course, they're not going to lead with a headline that says CMS finalizes physician payment <laughs> right. rule and decreases the the rates by 3.4%. So they lead talking about that they're advancing health equity. And as you look further into the, you know, press release, you see, you know, a lot of stuff around them uh creating codes in the um, social determinants of health space, mm -hmm. uh, adding payment models for community health workers, um, pretty big expansion around behavioral health, yep. um, and just a lot of the things that that fit into you know kind of community based care, uh, you know value based care that could work in the maybe Medicare uh, shared uh, savings program in, in yeah. an ACO model and partnership with different community organizations, right? So still coordinated care, but not full risk capitation, right? So it's almost like CMS is pulling the reins back a little bit on giving so much opportunity through the Medicare Advantage model and saying, no, 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 we're going to dial in the codes. We're going to be very, very thoughtful about the codes. And at the same time, we're recognizing that you know, we're having an explosion of of older people. We need to start funding caregivers. So there's a pr pretty big section yeah. in there around making sure that caregivers, whether they be in the family or third party, that we have a way to fund the need we're going to have for the yeah. growth of caregivers in America. Um, and then the the behavioral health, including behavioral health and Medicare, I think for the first time ever. Yeah, I think that's right. right. So so it's it's not simply taking cash away from physicians, it's sort of redistributing and rebalancing the scales and saying healthcare is not just going to be physician centric. We're going to spread the love and make sure that all these other really important parts um, of the care continuum are funded by the government. Yeah, I think that's right. They are, and we've talked about this a lot, the system has to move away from pure fee-for-service to more of a value-based, capitated, shared savings model. And I think CMS, to their credit, is working on multiple. I mean, it's four or five different initiatives that are announced. Not as much detail as I'd like, but I think that's definitely the trend. They're, they're moving uh, to be more aggressive on the fee-for-service price line item schedule, mm -hmm. but they're opening up several new initiatives to sort of encourage physicians, yes, in ACO models, and but but also community workers and other 
kind of allied care people at different licensure levels that honestly is really needed. And so there's not enough detail, but I, I think it's commendable that CMS is working towards this more holistic approach to whatever, whole person care or lots of different providers providing care. Right. Now, of course, uh, this is a blow to the old school. Yeah, it's a blow to the physician, physician groups. Yeah, to the physician yeah. groups and the physician business model, right? Uh, and that combined with the uh, No Surprises Act, uh, which at a dinner a couple of nights ago, uh, a friend of mine referred to as the one piece that you pull out of the Jenga stack, Jenga stack mm. that makes the whole thing fall down. Yeah. Um, this uh, this No Surprises Act uh, has really been a massive blow, and in particular, th this is this story is a it's a Wall Street Journal pro story in the, in their bankruptcy uh, category, but it's really sort of focusing on the private equity um, markets yeah. and all of the different um, PE backed you know, physician groups um, and related sort of ambulatory services and things like that that have been pushed to bankruptcy. Yeah. Um, really, as a result of the No Surprises Act, which forced the payers and the providers to sort of renegotiate and how really the providers, even though they have a method for um, going back and arguing and appealing, um, overall, they're losing the the claims denial battle, you know, yeah. and, it, and it's pushing a lot of them to, um, to, to either downsize or totally go out of business. Yeah, I, I think it is really hard on many private equity, but lots of companies in this space that sort of relied on a certain reimbursement payment structure. And then the government has changed that with this, with this rule. And I, you know, in general, I'm not for government sort of stepping in and, and pushing new things out, but, but it's hard to argue with not sort of somehow making it much more difficult for no patient choice. I mean, I, I get in a car wreck and I'm airlifted somewhere. If that airlift group is not in my network, I have no choice over that. And, and then I get hit three months later with a huge bill. That's why it's called no surprises. And it, it's it's it seems roughly good for the overall system, although it's really painful for these largely private equity groups that have invested – around a certain reimbursement structure that then changed midstream. So it's in the bankruptcy area because a lot of these companies are going to are going to be in risk of bankruptcy. Yeah, for sure. And and look, I mean we we've experienced it here in in, in Nashville. I think Envision yeah. was probably the first big one. American Physician Partners came came tumbling down after that. Mm -hmm. Um so this it's is affecting HCA. I mean HCA Oh had my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the I mean, talk about it. The you know the the, the JV and they yeah they, they, they were basically forced to buy the other side of the partnership that they had, and it's it's really unprofitable. It's a drag on earnings. Yeah, a hundred million dollars in that in the quarter it was stated. Yeah, and then I think and it's then fifty million, million per a, quarter for, for a year, right? Yeah, that's basically right. for a year. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, you know, not anything that. They won't work out. Yeah, but, it's not that they can't sustain it, but fifty million dollars is fifty million dollars. Yeah, it's that's, that's directly out of earnings. That's right, so. and, and and the fact that you can really kind of point to this No Surprises Act as yeah. the the one piece of legislation that and, and regulation that really created the problem, right? Right. Yes. The inability to bill a patient when things don't work out between you and the <laughs> insurer. <Right. laughs> um, yeah. All right, so we will stop there and take a break from all of our healthcare talk to dive into the tech world and uh, talk about the, the balance of power that is shifting. And we'll let Doug share a little bit about Jumpstart Foundry and we will be right back. Thanks guys for the opportunity to talk about our pre-seed fund, Jumpstart Foundry. My name is Doug Edwards, CEO of Jumpstart Health Investors, the parent company of Jumpstart Foundry. We're so excited to be able to talk about uh, early stage venture investing, certainly the need for us to change the crazy world of healthcare in the United States. We are spending 20% of our GDP, north of $4 trillion a year on healthcare with suboptimal outcomes. Jumpstart Foundry exists to help us find and identify and invest in innovative companies that are gonna make a difference in healthcare in our country. Every year, Jumpstart Foundry invests a fund, raises a fund and deploys that across 30, 40, 50 assets every year, allowing ease of access for our limited partners 
to invest to help us make something better in healthcare. Some of the benefits of Jumpstart Foundry is there's no management fees. We deploy all the capital that's raised every year in the fund. We find the best and brightest, typically around single digit percentage of companies that apply for funding from Jumpstart. And we invest in the most incredible, robust, innovative solutions and founders in the United States. Over the last nine years, Jumpstart Foundry has invested in nearly 200 early stage, pre-seed stage companies in the country. Through those most innovative solutions that Jumpstart Foundry invests in, we also provide great returns and a great experience for our limited partners. We partner with AngelList to administer the fund, making that ease of access, not only with low minimums, but the ease of investing in venture much better. We all know that healthcare is broken. Everyone deserves better. Come alongside us with Jumpstart Foundry, invest in making the future of healthcare better and make something better in healthcare. Thank you guys. Now back to the show. All right. So we, I feel like we were relatively on top of the open AI um, stuff. You yeah. know, we, we, we talked about the dev day before the implosion, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about the dev day and how powerful the tools were. And how we need to focus on need, AI. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the next week, um, S- Sam Altwin was, was, let go and we can talk about why but all of that I it was think, that it was that friday we recorded the yes, show on, on thursday, thursday and then he and was then on go friday, friday he was like right yes right. that's right and now and so that then over thanksgiving so we recorded the next week and, and de- debriefed all of that he was still out when we requested for thanksgiving we recorded a little bit early and then he got reinstated basically the employees exerted their power over the board, which was really interesting. The board is sort of the governance authority of every company. And yet when 720 of the 780 employees threaten to walk out, all of a sudden the employees have a lot of say. And so he, he's he been reinstated. They've redone the board, whole new board. And so we're kind of back to where we were a couple weeks ago. Yeah, except... Uh, there's now a lot of questions around what actually happened, yes. right? And there's a lot of questions about what will happen in the future. So yeah. we're we're and back the- we're back to where we were, except for we're not back to where we were, right? I mean, where we were when you and I were recording the episode two days after Dev Day was this stuff is incredible. They're gonna like knock over the, they're, oh, everyone. They're, they're gonna run down everything, yeah. right? And I can tell you, I've talked to you know several people who are at relatively big tech companies that are, you know, looking at integrating and they were almost entirely focused on open AI and chat Mm -hmm. GPT. And in the week that followed Sam being displaced, uh, they started looking hard at Bard. They started looking hard at, uh, hard at Claude. Yeah. Um, I think you have to. Yes. Cause they realized the concentration risk and the instability. Yeah. Uh, you know, no pun on, on, uh, on, on the AI tools, but the instability that could be present there. Right. I mean, cause honestly, this was, this was kind of a shit show. I mean, really. I mean, you know, just, <laughs> no question. There's no kind of anything. It was yeah. a complete shit show. You know, I mean, in terms of like something that's that's valued at billions of dollars. I mean, the way it all went down was definitely junior varsity. I mean, yeah, and and it it, it causes me, and I'm not everyone. You, we have other people to comment on that something. Something caught their attention and they felt like they had to make a change Mm -hmm. with the most successful CEO who has raised billions of dollars and launched the best received product in the history of tech products. And they have not disclosed really anything about why that was. And so it just creates a lot of speculation about what is there something that we should be nervous about that society should be nervous about that we don't know. Yep. And I think we we may never know. Yep. Yep. So let's just walk down this open AI path a little bit. Yeah. So because everything happens so fast. So just 10 days ago, which I think was like 2 days after Sam was let go or something. Yeah. Ted published a TED Talk 
of the chief scientist, Ilya Sutskever, who was at first on team kick Sam out and then apologized on X and was thankfully allowed to remain at OpenAI as Sam came back in and took back over. Yeah. Um, he, he was the credible tech lead advising the board when they let him go. Yeah, and he's a and, co-founder of, he, yes. of the company. He's yes. a co-founder and the chief scientist. Like, let's let's be clear. Sam is not a like AI scientist. Right, right. He was a VC. Right, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know, Sam like for he's people, not doing any coding. No, for people who don't know Sam Altman, Sam Altman was uh Paul Graham's successor for Y Combinator. Right. So he's a VC tech entrepreneur. He's an entrepreneur, but yes. he's not like a deep AI guy. Um this guy, Ilya, this he guy is, is a he deep is. AI guy. Right. You can look three years ago and see Lex Freeman interviewing him, talking about where AI is and where it's going. So this guy is a, is a deep AI guy. And he, and the title of his TED Talk is The Exciting Perilous Journey Toward AGI. Again, AGI means artificial general intelligence. Right now we're in specific uh Artificial intelligence, which is it's got a very specific domain. It's only as smart as the data that you feed it. It can't sort of think like humans do broadly and about all things that it encounters from a place of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Whereas AGI is basically human consciousness in computer in computer form. It's human consciousness with extendable memory and power and reach. Yes, self and the ability and the ability to learn. 24 hours a day and grow exponentially. Yeah. That's the point at which the computer is better than us. In, in everything. In everything. In everything. In everything. Including at building its own code for the next release. Right. And first of all, TED TED Talks, they had perfect timing to drop <laughs> this video. Um it it was it was the ideal time. Yeah. Because the one of the four most important names in the biggest story of the year, they had a TED Talk. It was about 30 days ago, but recent enough, and they hadn't published it yet, and they dropped it. And and it's a it's a well-done talk. It's it's 12 minutes. It's not that long. Yep. And he does a really good job explaining it where – you know, my mom can understand. It's it's not super technical, and it and it's really well done. And at about the five minute mark, he basically says about he healthcare. One, he gives one example. He gives one example. He uses healthcare, and basically he says what Dr. Tarun Kapoor said on our show last week. Yes, <laughs> which right. is the medical knowledge is going to double in such a way that. It's you're going to need to have. I mean, it, it, honestly, it was so shocking to me when I watched it, and then I was, you know, rewinding back to to Tarun, and yeah, I was like, yeah. "Did Tarun like watch this? And like, is is that where he got he, that uh, example he from?" Have I mean, because he just, yeah, because it, it, he's he's making the point that at some point we're going to look back at the way that we currently deliver care. And we're going to think it's like, you know, back when they put leeches on George Washington, right? You know, it's, yes. it's going to seem crude and and barbaric um, in the face of this computer that is going to be, you know, exponentially better than the human. Yeah. So just to, just people, everyone listening should watch, take 12 minutes yep. and watch it. But I think it's worthwhile to just emphasize that one of the top five AI scientists in the world chose one example to demonstrate how AGI could be beneficial. And he chose a medical doctor interaction to illustrate it. He did not choose revenue cycle management. No, no. <laughs> he did not choose back office anything. And he is giving an optimistic view but I mean, I'll, I, I, we have a lot of friends that are doctors and nurses and administrators and leaders, and healthcare is is not as good as it needs to be. And having a computer that knows every part of my medical record and all of the research and can bring in different 
things that we should look at together is really compelling. <coughs> so go watch the video. But then one final note on this before we move on to uh, to Elon is on X, Mark Andreessen, who just as a reminder, we've we've covered Mark in the past. He's co-founder of Andreessen Horowitz, the creator of the Netscape browser. So he's been in the internet as long as there's been an, a, you know a World Wide Web. He's I mean, been, his he's, profile was a tech optimist. He he is an investor and. He's a developer. He's yeah, very I mean, tech friendly. He, he he wrote that whole manifesto, you know, the tech no, the, <laughs> right. the, the tech optimist manifesto. We covered it. I don't know, yeah. probably five or six episodes back. So this is a guy who's a hundred percent like accelerate. He's all in on tech. Yeah, yeah, tech, 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 tech is all good. Anyone who says it's not good <laughs> is lying. And uh, he tweets seriously though. What did Ilya see? <laughs> that, right? That's the question everyone is asking. Right. And as usual, Mark is exactly on the sort of zeitgeist and something. Yeah. Right? I mean, he clearly saw something. He saw something. Okay. Moving to Elon. Elon was uh, one of several really high profile guests on uh, the Deal Book Summit. By the way, I think um, we're, we're not quite acknowledging who might be the biggest star of this whole Deal Book Summit uh Elon Musk using the F word fiasco, which is in my book, Andrew Ross Sorkin. I mean, this guy was able to get Elon Musk and Kamala Harris on stage yeah. at his event. Like, it's pretty good. That's ridiculous. Okay. Anyway, back to the story. Um, so, Andrew Ross Sorkin is interviewing Elon Musk, and he gets to a point where he's talking about the advertisers fleeing the platform uh, in, in the face of the recent anti Semitism uh, issues. And of course, you know, Elon is on stage, you know, days after meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu, right, right. <laughs> uh, you know, um, on, on the matter. And so Elon, in, in what I think is at this point becoming typical Elon fashion, uh, basically says, like, you know, you're going to boycott me with advertising, you're going to boycott me with money, go F yourself. Right. And then if, if anyone wasn't clear that he said that, he then repeated, <laughs> go F yourself. Right. Right. And then he said, hi, Bob. Uh, yeah. You know, talking about uh, the CEO of, yeah, uh, of, Disney. of Disney. I mean, I mean, there's so many things to talk about. <laughs> but I, I, I mean, think uh, I want to get to the power dynamic in a minute. But I think I've never spoken to Elon, but I, you know, obviously followed a bunch of stuff, and I think he bought Twitter, now X to try to protect free speech. And well that's what he says. So that's what he claims. That's what he claims. So he claims. And the wonderful thing about free speech is people can say whatever they want to say. And the terrible thing about free speech is people will say whatever they want to say. And I think of the choice of free speech or sort of a some Someone sitting in a dark room deciding who gets to say what, free speech is better. No, no, no question. Now, is there a lot of damaging, hate, shitty stuff on yeah. social media? Yes. Yeah. But the alternative is is worse. Yes. And so I think that's sort of the basic ethos that Elon goes with. But he also has more money than I have. So he he has enough power than to say like – you can't hold me hostage with advertising revenue. Go fuck yourself. And I don't think he's really bluffing. I think he's he's, he's, he's definitely not bluffing. Right. He's right. definitely not bluffing. And, and I, I think that, you know, the reason he's not bluffing is because he doesn't just have more money than everyone else. He's putting all the satellites in space. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> he's he's powering the Internet connectivity in wars. Right. He's he's deciding he's, what drones can fight the war and what drones can't. Who cares about X? Right. This, like this guy has legitimate geopolitical power. He, yes. he he's not just a rich guy. He's not Warren Buffett. Right. Like it's a it's we're we're talking about something entirely different with him, and he is demonstrating that difference. Yeah. Right. And, and so I think this next the next couple of stories are really about. The shifting power dynamic in our society, and Elon is symbolic, I think, of the technology entrepreneurial 
power side. And he's been really successful in, I can't tell you how many there are, maybe six or seven different high growth startups that he either was a founder in or early the first investor, including OpenAI that now he's gotten sideways with. But he is one of maybe 10 people that is sort of is driving the future of our economy and society. And I think that's, I don't know if it's good or bad. There's probably some aspects of both, but but it just it kind of is. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, it is is is, is the point. And, and I think your point about the power dynamic is is what we should focus on. And and this even goes back to when you were talking about how the you know the S and P and the Nasdaq indexes are so stacked with eight or nine companies. Yeah. Right. That that make up. 50, 60, 70% of the index consolidated into five, six, seven companies, and they all are really tech companies. You know, this goes back to, uh, you know, the Signa Humana merger, right? This goes back to UHG. And what really makes UHG powerful? Optum. What is Optum? A tech and data company, yeah. right? Um, and now we're accelerating all of, we're accelerating what was already tech dominance with AI. Yeah. And advertisers right? are, used to for, I don't know, 20 years, pushing media around. And that is fraying. It's not over, but it, but it's beginning to fray. I think, I think it's over. It's ending. It's ending. The power has peaked for already, but now it's still. S seems like it ended yesterday. Seems like it ended when Elon said, Go f yourself to the advertisers of X. Yeah, I mean, literally, uh, he's uh, X. X is independent, but there's a lot of TV that I see that is is not fully independent. So there is other media that is still pushed around by advertising, but I think that's declining. It's declining. Over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're, we're watching that die. Though, yeah, that's right? right. That's the that's point. Right. We're watching that die, and especially if you stratify across generations. Yes. It's already dead with Gen Z. Yes. Like it no question th about there, that. There, there is no advertising media business model that is powered by Gen Z. It's powered by us. It's powered by Gen X right. and the boomers. Right. But yeah, I think it stratified across generations. Declines it's over. that you go younger. Yes. That's right. Yes. It's over already, right? Um, okay. So then let's just talk about Elon's influence as an icon and as a cult of personality, right? So he does this. This gets everyone ginned up. I think I, I think maybe when I sent it to you, it wasn't like an official. Media. It wasn't a news story. It, it wasn't a news like story. It, it, was, it, was a, it was a tweet, right? right. Or, or, right. or next post or whatever you call these things, right? It was next post, and and the the post was celebrating him, right? Yeah, right. You know, and celebrating him in language, by the way, calling him based, which is something I think most Gen Xers don't even know mm -hmm. what that is. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Yeah, so. It's hard to actually articulate what what based is. It, it kind of came out of hip hip hop. There was a guy named um, what was his name? It was a little something, uh, but he was the based god, and and it it basically is like you're you're so on your own individual. St like like cool is is more like what's accepted with all, with other people. It's more like you make cool. You kinda. make cool. You create. You know. You create cool in ways that other people couldn't possibly even think about doing. Right. Yeah. Like you're rebasing what is what it means to be cool. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. That that's the way to think about. It. So 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 Elon was being called like you know the most based person of the day. Yeah. By what he was doing there. Right. Yeah. And then. But what, what we, I don't know if we explained to people that are just listening. So people were posting on X canceling Disney Plus. Yeah, no, we were about to get there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. yeah, so 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 Elon being celebrated on X for the way that he told all the advertisers to go F themselves. Yep. So what are the X loyalists to Elon? Yeah, how do? do they show their how do, loyalty? How, how do they yeah. how do they show their loyalty and their appreciation for him doing that? They start canceling their Disney Plus subscriptions yep. and putting screenshots. So now that's going to trend on X. Right. So it's, not it's so like it's a feedback loop. It's self reinforcing too, yeah. and it's fast, right? I mean, remember, we just watched the bank run of SVB 
happen in record time yeah. because it all happened in group chats. Right. The speed, again, the speed with which things are changing or with which, you know, a backlash can totally drop the market cap mm -hmm. of a company because we have a mass wave of subscriptions that just go away. All, yeah. all over what this guy says on stage, you know, at a Wall Street jour Journal event. Yeah. How, how do t tell now me? I think, tell, I me think, tell me how, as an analyst, you you model the future when that is, you know, when that's what's what's happening. You know, when one day OpenAI has a dev day, three days later the CEO is is fired by the board. A week later he's reinstated. Yeah. Microsoft is kind of in the mix. Four days later Elon goes on stage at Wall Street Journal and says, "Go f yourself to advertisers." The next day a bunch of people on X start quitting Disney Plus and turning it into a meme. Like, what world is this, dude? <laughs> you know, and, and I'm not saying like, it's, oh, it's so crazy, blah, blah, blah. I'm just saying, if you're not doing what we're doing, <laughs> tracking this every it. single yeah. week. It goes by too quickly. It's I mean, going too fast. Yeah. It's going too fast. That's right. And, and I mean, I, I think the advertisers made the first aggressive move but they they poked a bear that they shouldn't have poked well right? they they did what they felt they needed to do in the moment based on the playbook that sort of was in place before yeah but we're now seeing like there's there's a response to that playbook now that didn't previously exist. You know, before, if that happened to you, you would just have to, like, get on your knees and grovel and say, oh, right. I'm sorry. And we're not talking right or wrong here, by the way. We're not litigating. We're not the judge and jury yeah. of this. We're just – we're observing and we're retelling here. Right, you know? right. And previously, if you were called an anti-Semite and then all the advertisers left – you have to get on your knees and kind of grovel kind of, and say, I'm sorry, kind of here's right. my apology letter, right. you know, and then they probably make you like, like, wait, you know, three to six months. And then, and then they, this guy got on stage and said, go F yourself. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a new response to the playbook. And that is, I don't know how you can get a clearer sense of the shifting power dynamics than that. Yeah. I, I think, I think that's right. And I think, Podcasts and social media and X, honestly, are empowering individuals to have a voice. And if you begin to have smart things to say or you say things that make me think differently or I'll listen to the podcast, I don't necessarily need my media sort of curated by someone in Madison Avenue or whatever that's sort of issuing – uh, news articles and then putting banner ads around it. And that's started maybe with Facebook, but now it's just proliferated it and huge. And and Elon is probably the biggest profile like that. So shifting to Google, um, there was a there was a, a long running story about Google in Canada um, around the around the links to Canadian news and whether or not you know Google was profiting on them and you know there's the whole summaries that they were showing on the yeah. homepage and so they were fighting 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 and Google said we're just gonna pull the news from Canadian searches right, that's, right, that's right. what we're gonna do like yeah. you know I, I think I think I think maybe Zuckerberg started this whole like we'll just pull the news mm -hmm. yeah in, he did in, in, in Europe yeah I think. exactly yeah, exactly right. his his response to like. These different, you know, right. um, countries and continents saying, you know, uh, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that. He's just, like, I'll just pull it. Yeah, you know. And again, this is a show of the of the of the power. It's power of tech and the the social media or digital search as compared to a newspaper in Ottawa or whatever. Yeah, and the the news media is losing. Well, is it well? The news They're media is lost. losing, but I think the bigger thing is I think the nation states yeah. yes. are losing. That's yeah. the bigger thing. The nation states are losing. Yes, the na Canada, <laughs> the nation state of Canada, which I don't know, it's a top twenty country. Yeah, they tried to protect their their homegrown news organizations, and they 
they don't they have the they, ability to they do they that. Can't protect they don't have them. the ability to do that. Yeah. The the Magnificent Seven, Google and Microsoft, Apple, whatever. The, Amazon, they, Meta. They have more power than nation states, except the United States. Yep. And, and China. And China. And the thing that they don't have is military. Right. And what's interesting about X is X, X, well, not X, Musk has um, the satellites. Yep. And so a lot of nation states are going to need the satellites, and you can't really get internet service in some places. It, it just um, the balance of power is shifting. They're they're running their military on their networks, right? Exactly. <laughs> so you you can just like <laughs> unplug it, and then the military drones don't work. So don't work. So the it's a balance of power thing um, that is interesting. Yeah, and then and then the final story we want to just tell around around all this tech stuff is that. Uh, the tech giants are finishing the year how they started the year, yep. which is with layoffs. They did big ones, right? 7% across the board. Mm -hmm. Every big tech company did 7% in Q1. Uh, but even as they have readied and steadied the ship and they're profitable and they're growing and the stock is performing I mean, well. Record, record highs. Stock market. Yeah, I mean, yeah. meta, unbelievable, right? They're still cutting. Yeah. They're and still I cutting. <laughs> Right. So it is tech and leaders in tech gaining power over nation states, over their customers, advertisers. But even the workers at these technology companies are losing power because these companies now have automation and AI and technology, and they, they rely on the, the broad-based team less than they have in the past. That's counterbalanced a little bit with the open AI employee walkout. Well, what but kind the, of employees? I mean, yeah, let's let's right. be clear. I mean, if you're on the AI team, I think you're okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. If you're a large language model AI developer, you're, you're worth you like 30 power. regular employees. Right. Yes. But they don't need as many people. I mean, so I was at Thanksgiving and and Someone asked me like what the effect AI is going to have, and I need to be careful because right, it's it's a Thanksgiving dinner. But <laughs> but, uh, but I think that something like half the jobs that exist today aren't going to be here in ten years. Oh, dude, I, I know. I, listen, and like we have to figure so out what else people are going to do. It's it is so hard to have that perspective and try to have conversations about it. Yeah, it's really hard to do it. You know. And we're not driving it, so we're just trying to. No, I'm. I'm just trying to like keep up myself. Yeah, and exactly. invest in the right things in healthcare. Yeah. So. All right. So just to kind of change topics for the end of the show, uh, a positive story in the Wall Street Journal talking about how CRISPR is uh, poised to win FDA approval uh, next month. Not 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 CRISPR itself, but a treatment that's based on CRISPR. Um, you know, this is going to. It's it's a health equity story actually because you know we're going to finally be addressing um, sickle cell yeah. uh, disease, which is something that f has forever been underinvested in, um, you know, misunderstood for for a million reasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know we're we're about to leverage DNA editing uh, technology to to cure it. Now, of course, the the parallel sort of problem with that is going to be the cost. And also, who is going to qualify for this, right? So, you know, just for anyone who doesn't understand how sickle cell works, um, you know, it's basically a mutation of the of the cell, the red blood cell that was designed to protect against malaria um, in Africa, um, but then sort of had an extra adaptation that results in blood clots and all sorts of other really, you know, negative. Uh, uh, it's it's just comorbid with a lot of things. Yeah, and, it was and, selected and, for by evolution. Yes, for to protect, people in Africa. Yes, to protect against yeah. malaria. But it, it it has it has adapted to become sort of a um, just just a really really devastating disease. People do die from it, and and even when they're not dying, they have chronic diseases, just like you know your your typical um, autoimmune diseases. Yeah. Um. So and just because of the 
DNA heritage, it affects black populations. That's right. Almost exclusively. I, I, I've never heard of a white person yeah, having sickle right. cell. So, um, so say all that to say, it, it's 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 been one of those areas in the black community where you know we have felt just unattended to. You know, right. as here's a black disease that nobody wants to do anything about, and now we have you know this state of the art technology, this CRISPR technology is is coming in with finally a solution for it. But again, the cost, right? Um, you know this this. This is likely going to be, you know, a million dollar um, solution because it's going to cure you. Yeah, it, it's it is a one time change your genes such that your red blood cells do not have this mutation anymore. Right, and then thereafter you formerly had sickle cell, but you no longer have sickle cell. That's right. And first of all, that's just incredibly positive for for people that get the treatment. It's amazing. I think we have to fund it. Period. We have to fund it. Now, our healthcare system is not designed for I mean cures are are hard to finance because it's a one-time thing and whatever insurance group I'm on today I guess has to bear all that cost, but then I I'm much less expensive for all the insurance companies later. So the the basic structure of how we provision care is not well designed for this. But I don't think that matters. We have to figure out a way to get it done. But again, I mean, you want to talk about an entire business model that on one end is flanked by AI and on the other end is flanked by gene editing. I mean, the physician. Th th this to me is really becoming the nexus of disruption, right? Whether it's the No Surprises Act, whether mm -hmm. it's the decrease in the physician fees, whether it's the advent of, of new AI that everyone is predicting is going to end up being better than a physician in five, 10 years um, when it comes to you know understanding all the medical knowledge and being able to actually diagnose, or whether it's should we have you, the physician, caring for this person for 5, 10, 15, 20 years and prescribing all sorts of small molecule you know solutions that really are only just – somewhat mitigating uh you know the the issue but not actually curing it versus gene editing and just cure them period done it's over you're not sick anymore i mean on all ends it feels to me like the physician is is really being flanked well i mean i guess so i have a more optimistic view of it i think that there's going to be a long time where i still will value having a human with empathy help me navigate this, but that doctor or nurse or caregiver should have all of these AI tools and be able to sort of help me navigate it with, empowered by those things, including gene editing. And I, th I think if I cure some aspect of my health, the normal human reaction in my mind is, what's the next thing that I should work on? It's not like I'm going to say I don't have sickle cell anemia anymore, so so I never have a word about my health. I I take an optimistic view that there'll be a role for empathetic caregivers to advise and help people live healthier lives, but they have to adopt and learn all of these technologies, and our industry is not designed that way right now. So there's a big change. Big change. I, and and doctors are at the f right there at the forefront of it. Right. And don't doctors love to change? <laughs> yeah. They, they're not gonna <laughs> they're not gonna like changing. So that's my point. That's my yeah. point. Like I can I can agree with you and align with you on the optimistic take for the doctor of the future. For the for the doc for the doc I I talked to an MD MBA today. Like he is gonna love this new world. You know what I yeah. mean? He's going to love to to provide care in this new world. Yeah, where, if you've been where, practicing where for it's no value, time it's, or less than five years, you can change easily. Totally. It's value-based. You're leveraging technology. You're able to actually, you know, yeah, cure I can help people for real. 500 people now, not 50. I don't have to week. worry about my own dumb brain because the AI is going right. to make a better decision than I am, yeah. you know, nine out of ten times. Like, he's going to love it. But 50-year-old doc? Yeah. With – a lot of debt, and they did everything right. Hold on. 
and identity yeah. wrapped up in how they deliver things. You know, like I I just think, again, dislocation and disruption. It doesn't mean physicians are going away. I'm just saying they are the nexus of a lot of disruption. Yeah. That's yeah. that's what I'm that's the point I'm making. That's right. And and they're going to go from, you know, in the 70s and 80s, the top of the social status, smartest, wealthiest, most well-regarded profession in the world. And they're going to have to change every way they practice medicine. And that that is going to be very difficult. I think that's but, right. But but to, we're not going backwards. No. No, and I think net there's going to be a lot of disruption, a lot of change, but it's going to be better to cure sickle cell. So like it's better, it's, it's better, it's amazing. And it's I think great. Um, this is the first CRISPR related cure. It's not quite approved yet, but it's about to be it's approved about to by be the FDA. Got approved think... in in UK, um, but I think there's a lot of other things oh. that, are, that are in the pipeline. And uh, we talked about alpha fold and the protein folding. And so you, we're now sort of building all of these tools that are going to allow us to see what needs to be changed. And then we have the technology to go in and, and okay, let's change those three base pairs. And, and all of a sudden, you're cured now. Yep. Which is, which is great it's and remarkable. positive. And there'll be massive disruption, but I think that it'll also <laughs> be good. By the way... Um, Walter Isaacson, who wrote the Steve Jobs book and wrote yeah. the Elon Musk book, I believe he also wrote a book on Jennifer Doudna. Yes. He did. Um, and so, you know, we just want to kind of give a shout out to Jennifer Doudna, whose whose name does not get enough recognition yes. for the unbelievable Nobel Prize winning breakthrough of CRISPR. Um, but that's a that's an audio book that I have in my queue. Yeah, and, she, and I haven't read it yet either, but she's a very successful woman in science that won the Nobel Prize. And a great role model for everyone, but for women especially, to see you can succeed. And she's making a huge impact on oh, the world. Changing the world. Yes. I mean, CRISPR is going to change the world. So, yes. um, all right. That's it. Another show in the books. Uh, anything else to, to cover? No, I don't think so. We'll see what happens next week. A lot, all right. A lot going on in the world. Look forward to it. Talk to you then. Bye.